Okay. Um, ah, someone coming here. So we'll we'll go a bit more now into modeling, but there will not be much of that, as I mentioned during this course. Um, let me get this thing. Um, and what I'll talk about now is is hydrological modeling. So so groundwater, surface water uh, modeling. A presentation mainly made by my colleague. Uh, Douglas Graham from DHI. <coughs> and the question he's asking here in the beginning is whether a fully integrated model of surface and groundwater is a silver bullet, you know, where you can kill anything right, with that one. Is that the, uh, the solution? Um, challenges that we're facing, as mentioned here, topography drives hydrology and vice versa. Um, we have... Uh, in the unsaturated zone, that the participation of, of rainfall in infiltration, runoff, and, and potential evaporation, and, and often not the tools to very accurately describe this. The very dynamic stream flow in, in, in many cases um, taking place, and the, and, and the interaction between the different sources. There's a tendency to have groundwater treated separately from surface water. You have, here in India, you have Central Water Commission on the surface water and groundwater, uh, the Central Groundwater Board looking at that, and in states and so on also, and also different uh, departments, not really cooperating, even though water is water, and, it's, and groundwater comes from infiltration, infiltration from the surface and so on. So <clears throat> this significant feedback is not always uh, considered. That in general, groundwater recharge is quite complex, both in space and time. Um, where it's occurring uh, and, and how it's taking place. So looking at this, you would think that the only way to really describe uh, groundwater and, and the hydrology would be to have a fully integrated model, which is distributed in space and time um, to, uh, to do this. So the water cycle, as, as you all know, where we have the precipitation, there might be snow coming in. If it's snow, of course, then it's stored for some time in, uh, on, until it melts again. It might even be glaciers, of course, that, that uh, builds up over the time. But then surface runoff and infiltration, percolation through, uh, through the ground, soil moisture. Uh, storage is well, also in the ocean from where it evaporates and, and returns to the cycle, evaporation from... Uh, from land. So you could, of course, model this in down to the last little detail, right, if you want, which would require an enormous amount of data and very advanced models. But one question is, what do we get out of this? Do we really need to, uh, to do all this, describe all these different processes in great detail? And do we need to have all these processes involved every time we look at hydrology? <coughs> So here's a, here's a model which is not a hydrological model, but it's a model of uh, an area, in this case a town. It's called a map, and many of you know this. So if you're going to go from place one to place two here, if you have a map like this saying, well, here's a road with this name, and here's Linwood Road, and here's that road, looking at that map can tell you where to go, and then you just go there. Um, but it doesn't describe everything. There are lots of houses, there might be some parks, there are pav pavements, there are all sorts of things in that area which are not in the model because it's a very simple model. Right? But if the purpose is only, I want to know how to go from here to there, then you're fine. Right? Um, so, so it works, of course, if we then look at it and then we start walking and then we come down here and say, was it left or right? I don't remember. Right? Then you're, so, so you'll need it. Uh, you could, you took, could take a satellite picture instead. Then you get all the details right? uh, in there. 
<coughs> and, or, or if you have it on your phone, and it'll even show you where you are, of course. So there are more advanced methods. But basically, the basic map will, will in most cases, serve the purpose. <coughs> so you can compare this a little bit to, to the modeling we do in hydrology, where you have the, um, the distributed down here and the lumped and conceptual over here, physically based in this way. Right? <coughs> so using the simple lumped way, um, well, one of the good things about it is it doesn't require much data. Uh, a lumped model, whether it's of, of uh, a city or, or in hydrology, a lumped model is much easier to use and to set up because you can do that with relatively little data. Um, it requires, well, here my colleague writes, heavily calibration, but that depends a bit on exactly where you're going. It requires cal calibration. Right? Um, and it's typically not suited for what's called scenario analysis. If you have a catchment area where um, you may see vast uh, deforestation, so the, all the trees are being cut down, how is that going to affect the hydrology and the water availability downstream? A lump model is not going to tell you that. Or if you have uh, an area where you have groundwater uses next to each other, and then there's another farm coming over here that said, I would also like to extract some groundwater. And you want to know how will this new groundwater well impact the water availability in the other wells. Again, a lump model will not, is not going to give the answer. So there are a range of different issues that you cannot uh, solve with just lumped models. If your question is, what is the runoff from this area from rainfall, and I have these 20 years of calibration, then the lump model is fine. And we have made some tests at, uh, at DHI where we've taken all the hydrological models we have and compared them on how well do they serve different purposes. And in terms of just simulating the runoff, the lump conceptual was actually better. Maybe because it's, actually, it's easier to use, setting it up and using it within the time available, you could really refine the calibration. Whereas if you're setting the advanced models up with all the, uh, the details, um, it's, it's more complicated. Um, that was the lump. For the conceptual distributed models, or the distributed models, say, um, uses available detailed data if it's available, uh, and in this way, in principle, less d dependent on expertise. So if you have an area where you're, you really are well uh, equipped with data, you basically know everything, putting that in, then the software or this, for these distributed physically based models, the software will handle much of it. Right? Well suited for scenario analysis, uh, but often though, getting all this data is difficult. Um, so you can look at it just for groundwater models. So here's basically a simple model, you could say, of the, of the geology, where you have volcanic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and sand and gravel. But in this, with, with limited data, if the layers are just like that. Actually, they may be like this. right? but you don't have enough information to, uh, to describe this. So the lump model, can we point to this one also? Somehow, yeah. The lump models, uh, what they do is that one subcatchment like this one is regarded as one unit. So here's a reservoir, and this would typically be one catchment. Right? So in this one catchment, you have one time series of rainfall. That's the catchment rainfall based on whatever you do. You have one parameter, all, all the parameters, there's only one of each, you could say. So typically you have a parameter describing the, uh, the root zone. That's got one value. And in reality, of course, within this area or, or down here, there, is, there are rocky areas in the upstream, perhaps. There's maybe some sandy soils. Uh, slopes are different. Uh, vegetation is different. So the hydrology is not the same within this area. So it's an approximation. Uh, so the distributed model can take that into account. <clears throat> but if you zoom in on one of these grids in the distributed model, inside that grid, you only have one. Right? So, so there's one grid of forest, maybe. Right? But that forest may have different trees, and then it has a little wetland here. And even there are also differences. Right? Then, of course, you can make the grid smaller. But how small, do you, you know? 
Yeah. And do you have the data to do that, right? So it's not, it's not like a distributed model will just solve all your problems. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, a lot of things, of course, happens in uh, within the in the catchment areas. Difficult to see all this, but you're having you're having a general infiltration taking place, uh, but also infiltration in. Or you may have it here, this, you can't see that, but this is an underground storage tank, maybe storage of oil even or something. If that starts leaking, what happens here? Uh, if it's water, well then that might also leak and, and add to the, the water. There is infiltration from different areas here, uh, urban areas where, where you might have pollution, um, agricultural areas where you're using irrigation, so the infiltration is higher, but again also in different quality than uh, uh, and just the rainwater in infiltration, large variations in the, um, uh, in, in the soil types and vegetation types and so on. So there are a lot of differences, of course, in the hydrology. And, and if, again, if we want to know what happens exactly here, um, if we change something, if, if you want to extract groundwater or there are other changes at that exact location, how is that going to impact other conditions in that area? Well, then you have to model this in great detail, and the lump conceptual will not work. If your question is from this large area, somewhat downstream here, what is the, what is the runoff at that location based on rainfall in the catchment area? Your lump model is fine, right? So, so often you need to change tools, I think, and that goes for many, stuff, many different kind of, of traits and so on. The appropriate tool for the appropriate uh, problem you need to solve. <coughs> so integrated models are useful when you have this surface uh, groundwater uh, interaction. When land use changes are occurring, um, climate change patterns, but I would say often actually the lump conceptual can also handle um, climate change because if it's just a question of changing your potential evaporation and your rainfall, um, you, you can easily get uh, results from that also. Wetlands, Environmental issues, social issues, perhaps. What a, well, that's a very broad uh, concept. So what do we get out of the model? Um, well, again, I mean, you, 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 it depends on what you want to get out of them. Um, often you need, if you need to describe this feedback between groundwater, surface water, and evaporation, uh, and in detail like this, where you can see what actually happens uh, at, each, at each grid is, again, at the advanced models we're going for. Um, with, uh, uh, and, and which is not just giving you the groundwater balance, but a full balance of, of the um, uh, surface and groundwater. So now we're talking about the advanced models, right? You get the surface described, you have the infiltration, you have the groundwater conditions, um, and, and going in all directions, right? So, so even if you have evaporation from groundwater coming up, um, that can also be described here. Yeah. Wetlands are often uh, also a key issue in this case. But this is then often the issue, as also we discussed before. The data is just not there, right? Um, so often you end up guessing, uh, more or less, or you use experience from elsewhere, and then you put this value, and then that's your data, right? So the question is how much you actually get out of, of, detailed, uh, of detailed models. Here is a, a special case. The, it's called the, the Fermi problem. And the question was here, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? Um, and nobody knew. There was no register. There was no way of doing it. And sometimes when you don't know, you can use other information to find out. So he was thinking, uh, how many people live in Chicago? How many persons on average uh, are there in each household? And what fractions of household has a piano which is tuned regularly? How often is it tuned? How long time does it take with travel time? And how many hours does a piano tuner work every day? So if you can answer some of these questions, there are about 9 million people uh, 
two persons on average, one in 20 has a piano. It tunes them once every year, it takes two hours. And he wanna work eight hours a day, five days a week for 50 weeks. Right? So all those numbers you can calculate, well, 225 piano tuners would do it. And actually it turned out that's 290. Right? So, so sometimes you can just use other indicators, you can say, to estimate what is actually the data that you don't have. Um, whether you can do that exactly in, 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 uh, in hydrology depends a bit on what you're looking for. Because right? um, often it's, like we say here, it's complex, it's uh, spatially distributed, and, and difficult to, to predefine simple boundaries as, as with traditional models with the infiltration coming in, right? But you could, of course, say, uh, what is the rainfall? What is the infiltration rate? Slope, land use, evaporation, vegetation? You know. Similar kind of questions can often, often give you an idea, at least, of, of where you're going if you don't have the data. Right? Um, so sometimes, if you are in a situation where you do need to use the advanced models, and you need to describe your catchments in, in great detail, but don't have the data, well, then there are other ways of at least estimating it. Uh, another way is, is that you then use maybe a number of different estimates uh, that represent the, the variation that you would expect. So this a particular type of data, it, it's probably here. It might be as high as here, or it might be as low as this. Well, then you try a range of these different values and run them all through the model and then see how does it affect my results uh, that I'm considering this variation here. It may, of course, end up being that you can't use your answer for anything, but very often, at least, you say, well, I'm within this range of, uh, of results, and, and that might still be useful. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. One of the problems that data is a challenge is also that it's often managed in silos. Um, that Central Groundwater Board has got the groundwater data, that an upstream state don't want to give you to give them any data on their river if you're down if you're working for a downstream state and so on. That that data is not readily available. We might talk about this more this uh, tomorrow also. <clears throat> yeah, I think we'll skip that today. So can we model everything? Um, maybe not, but it depends again on the, on on the purpose. Um, Inundation like this, if you're modeling floods, um, that uh, often the problem in modeling floods is that you don't have the topography very accurately. You have, uh, if you can get a DEM, fly a LIDAR or even a, a drone, where you can get very, very detailed data. But it's very expensive still. And if it's not available, well, download a DEM from some satellite, but it's very rough, so, so how accurate does it describe it? So, so very often you won't be able to say uh, with the model that, well, the inundation will stop here, it, this will be fine, and this is actually flooded. That level of detail may not be required, or, or may not be possible, but it may also not be required. It depends, again, on the purpose right? of, of how detailed do you need to be to come up with answers that can actually be used to take the decisions that need to be taken. Um, Drought is a, is a big issue. Um, urban modeling, we see a lot. Wetlands uh, is a key concentration. Irrigation uh, areas. But as we've already discussed, whatever you model, you, you design that for the purpose. You select your tool for the purpose, and then you set it up for that particular uh, purpose. So that means that even though you have a model of an area, you may often find yourself in a situation where you say, well, I can't use this because now my issue is different. So I actually have to start with a completely different tool um, and, and do that. So there's no model that handles everything. And often you need to, to simplify it. Um, not too simple, of course, again, depending on, on the purpose, um, describing the problem. Yeah, I don't think I'll go too much. I think we discussed generally the, the uh, issues here. Yeah, selecting of different software um, exactly to, to, to meet the specific requirements that, that you're having. 
Mike C, that you might know, um, some of you. This is uh, uh, quite a detailed model that describes the surface. So you have the river flow, actually using Mike 11. Uh, you have the infiltration here described as, well, we actually model the, the unsaturated zone here. Uh, so what happens in each of these different uh, grids. And then groundwater in three dimensions. Um, even though what we've done in Maxi also is that we have alternative groundwater models that are then two-dimensional and even just a simple storage. Because if groundwater is not the issue, it's mainly the infiltration of surface water you're looking at, you don't need to have this advanced uh, and get data for, for that advanced one. So the same with evaporation, you can describe that in different ways that require a different amount of data and so on. So it doesn't have to be the full-scale uh, detailed physically based model every time. <coughs> yeah. Precipitation with snow melt is there. Uh, evaporation that is then based on which, uh, which vegetation you're using. Uh, the unsaturated flow and saturated groundwater. Channel flow, overland, also flooding is there. Water use, which is cal calculated from the demands. And then uh, water quality in, in all these different uh, phases. So surface groundwater and so on. Um, yeah, and with all these physical based models that are not required for every process at, at all times. So you can use simpler uh, methods and, and mix them also, working at different scales in both space and time. Yeah, so it's not a silver bullet, but, but useful, uh, p particularly when you have these uh, interaction between surface water and, and groundwater. Fit for purpose, I think we've said all this. Um, yeah. So going through this rather quickly, but also because that's not the main issue of, of, of the course here, right? Um, we're gonna take one model and go through that in detail in a minute. And that is then one of the simpler ones. Uh, but one that is being used, I think, much more frequently, actually, by us than, than the Mike Xi. We also have one called fee flow, you might have heard of, which, which is used in mines, for example, where, where things are very three-dimensional often, and, and uh, where, you ha where you have to go in very, very detail with the hydrology. But in most cases, we're looking at catchments. We're working with the data that's available. Um, so, uh, so it's the simpler models that are used. So let me skip to that. And now I'll just sit down for a while um, and take it from here. So basically here we're not used with NAM is still a hydrological model, but it's also just a rainfall runoff model, and that's the main um, purpose of that. So based on the rainfall, what is the runoff coming? Um, and, and what happens out there in nature is that if we take, uh, yeah, we have the mouse here. So <coughs> rainfall that occurs then uh, on land, some of it hits the vegetation directly, and if it's just a small drizzle, a rainfall runoff model is supposed to simulate this. So again, you have input, which is the rainfall and the potential evaporation. And then you set a number of parameters so that the model can describe the overland flow, the interflow, the base flow, the evaporation, and the recharge. There are some very simple models out there. Uh, SCS method, for example. You give it the rain, and this is the runoff, right? There's no storage. There's no... I think you can consider whether the soil was wet or dry beforehand, but it's very simple, right? SCS methods has been used a lot around, and still being used around the world for design and so on. Um, but I've seen a study where somebody took, I think it was 1,600, so 1,600 catchment areas where they actually had measured runoff from heavy rainfall. And then they applied the SCS method to see what does it say it's coming in, in peak rainfall, and what actually came. And the error was more than 50% in two thirds of the cases. So in like 60, 70% of those 1600, the deviation between the actual and the model was more than 
basically telling you that SES doesn't work. Right? Uh, but still, if you need a quick estimate, well, it's a start. Uh, and, and the fact that in the US, this is an accepted method. So it's accepted in most parts of the world. So, so uh, if you do it and you design, nobody can blame the engineer if, if the structure fails, because as long as the calculation was correct. But the method itself is basically not good. Anyway, that's, uh, that's something a little different. These rainfall runoff models, like the NAM that we'll be talking about now, is used in general hydrological analysis for looking at how the runoff is distributed between base flow and, and surface flow and so on. Uh, and some estimation on the catchment basis of what is the evaporation losses, what is the infiltration and so on occurring in, in these basins. Um, in flood forecasting, uh, this is also generally the type of model that we are using and which, is, which are being used around the world. The advanced uh, Mike Xi type physically based models, they take too long both to set up but actually also in the calculation. And in terms of simulating flood runoff, they're not doing any better than, uh, um, than the simple ones. So flood forecasting, even flow forecasting, uh, the, the, are, are being operated by these models. Um, to extend the stream flow record is a question of, of having longer time series. Often if you, you, maybe you want to make statistics somewhere, what is the 100 year flood at this location? And you have measured discharge for three years. The likelihood that you have high peaks in those three years or that the distribution of peaks in three years is enough to estimate the 100 year flood is not very high. Right? I mean, this is a very weak basis. But then often in the catchment area, you have maybe 50 years of rainfall. So if you can take your three years of runoff and calibrate your models on those three years, and then you take the 50 years and generate runoff for, 50, for a long period of time. It's likely that in this long period, you'll have some higher peaks, uh, some lower, whatever, but you'll have a, a much longer time series of uh, runoff, including peak runoff every year, and a better basis for estimate your, your 100 year flood in that location. Um, or for other reasons, to just get, get long uh, time series of, of stream flow based on, uh, on the available data. So we have this NAM model, right, which, uh, which gets the rainfall, uh, it's input up here. If it's snow, then it's, it's a snow storage for a while. But otherwise, this precipitation comes in here in an upper storage, which corresponds a bit to these, uh, um, the, the vegetation that we, we, uh, we showed on the, on the, on the, a while back, that if it just rains a little bit into this storage here, which is called the upper storage, it will just evaporate from that and that's it. No runoff occurs. If it rains enough, then it spills over and it's divided here between overland flow and infiltration into the root zone and further into the groundwater. Yeah, so there's a root zone here and that storage in the root zone is then calculated all the time. So how much water do we have there? And if there's a lot of water in the root zone and it rains, then you get high runoff. If there's basically nothing, it infiltrates. So like it happens in in hydrology as such. So, uh, and, then in, and then down into the groundwater where, where you have the base flow. So if we look at the different processes, evaporation, whenever there's water in this upper storage, it'll evaporate from there, and that'll be potential evaporation, um, which is then based on whatever you have of, of data, pans, and so on. If, if this is empty, then it evaporates from the root zone, and here is then a relation of, of, the, of the root zone storage, what, what the evaporation actually takes place. <coughs> this overland flow is divided uh, here when, once it spills over, <coughs> and that's an equation which is graphically illustrated here. Um, L was this lower zone or root zone, so L by L max is how much water do we have in the root zone compared to its maximum. So here the root zone is full of water and here it's empty. Um, what this equation is saying is that, that the overland flow in relation to the rainfall occurring would be zero if we have very little soil moisture. So 
So if it's uh, completely dry, uh, or very dry, uh, a very low soil moisture in the root zone, you have rainfall, it all infiltrates. Nothing runs off. Once it starts filling up, you then start to get some, and the more you have in the root zone, the more runoff you get. Um, if you have a catchment where, which is very homogeneous, let's say we have a, a relatively flat catchment area, sandy soils, um, more or less the same vegetation everywhere as one catchment. Then we have another one with a lot of variation where you have the uh, uh, rocky hills up the, upstream maybe, and then you have some slopes with, with, with some clay soils, and you have sandy soils below and so on. Which of these two do you think will have the highest value of this threshold? So, so again, the threshold here says, if this is high, it means that as long as the, the soil moisture and the root zone uh, uh, for a long time, you need a lot of rainfall before you get any runoff at all. Right? It rains, nothing happens. It rains again, nothing happens. Uh, then this is high. If this is basically zero or, or nothing, uh, it means that as soon as it rains, you get some reaction. So which is the, which is the catchment where you get the reaction first? Is that the flat, sandy, sim or is it slope. slope? Yeah. It's the, it's the other one. It's the one where you have, because upstream you had this rocky area, uh, even with high slope. So as soon as it rains in the catchment, that part of the catchment is going to give some runoff, right? The rest will not give runoff. It comes from up there. So therefore, if it starts, to, or let's take it here, it, it's still low. We're not, we're not up here yet. It's still a low runoff because it's only part of the catchment contributing. But these catchments with this large variation typically have this small value of this threshold, whereas the ones that are very homogeneous, you get the larger values. So the model is not describing that this is a rocky area and this is a whatever directly, but indirectly, you actually get the impact of these variations described in parameters like this one. Yeah, Interflow has got a similar kind of equation coming out of this upper storage. <coughs> and the groundwater recharge again also. So all of these are depending on the... Um, uh, on the root zone storage, this L by L max, as it's called. Um, base flow is basically s quite simple. That um, it, there's an equation here, and it basically says the the pressure that we have, so the the water level in the in the groundwater over wherever it flows out as base flow, the higher the difference, the higher the flow, right? So, and and a bit like a uh, a, uh, a first order decay uh, simulation like that. And for a long time in this NAM model, this was just fixed that we had uh, a fixed level, you could say, where it flows out. But then we were working in Bangladesh um, in, uh, uh, and the, the, the problem in, or in a delta area like, like most of Bangladesh is, you have these big rivers coming in uh, for, and they are interconnected and so on, so there's there's water all the way around. So a catchment is an, is an island, more or less. Right? You have, uh, and it's just a few meters above ground. Um, and the groundwater doesn't flow down a river. It flows to any side. I mean, if this river is higher, then it flows that way. And otherwise, it does like this. Right? So you can't really measure the runoff from these areas also. The only thing you actually can measure is the depth of the groundwater. Um, and of course, when it rains, it infiltrates, groundwater levels increase, but then if the rivers are falling and it doesn't rain, well then it, it'll drain out, the groundwater is going to follow the rivers down. Then in June when it comes, water comes in the rivers, maybe if it hasn't even started raining yet, the rivers go up and then it seeps into the groundwater from the rivers. Right? So the, the height, you can say, of this hole in the groundwater storage here that varies over year, over the year. Where it flows out it varies with the river levels. So we actually changed the model to be able to describe that. Um, we've never used it anywhere else. So 
but just a curiosity. So looking at these different parameters that we have um, in, in a model like this, and let me just mention that we'll, we'll run a little exercise um, where you're going to try to change some of these parameters later today. It's not the real NAM model, but it's, it's what you call a NAM calibrator where you can easily see the impact of changing these. So we're going to go to the lab and try that. But let me just go through these parameters. Um, so there, there are these storages, the... Uh, the upper storage and the lower storage from which it can evaporate. <coughs> and, and the upper, the U has got a maximum contents here, which is typically with, from 10 to 25 millimeters, and it controls evaporation and the size of small peaks. Whereas the larger one here corresponds to the root zone, is, is, has uh, a larger capacity, and is very important for the overall water balance of um, of the catchment area. Then we have an overland flow coefficient which controls uh, the amount of water going up here uh, as overland flow. Um, basically the excess rainfall after this first loss here uh, generating runoff. So this is just a coefficient between 0 and 1 basically. Uh, on the computers are a little file describing this also. In, in the lab. The threshold value that we just discussed uh, for the overland flow is uh, delaying, you can say, the flow um, in, in the beginning of a wet season. So if, if it's zero, then as soon as rainfall starts, runoff will also start. If it's higher, then there's some delay taking place. And the same for groundwater recharge, and one for interflow is also there. <coughs> so for the base flow, there's a time constant which is quite high in hours, up to 5,000, and which describes the base flow hydrograph. So how does the, uh, how does the flow recede after a wet season? How does it slowly go down? Uh, we also have a time constant for routing the overland flow, and that mainly determines the shape of peaks. Um, so if it's small, we get a flashy peak re reacting quickly. If it's larger, then the peak is slow and, and and lasting for a longer time. Snow, which is, I think, not so relevant, but still, in, of course, in northern India, you're having that. Um, snow is also described, and, and here you, that is then one case where you can't just lump everything, because uh, even within a catchment area, you don't have the same snow layer uh, in all, all over the catchment, because you have different elevations, as illustrated here, and typically, you can have lots of snow up here, a little here, and nothing down here at the same time. And you need to take that into account. Right? So, so for, for snow simulation, we divide the catchment in, in different elevation zones. It can even have different precipitation also in, in those, in those uh, cases. And, and different parameters to describe that retention in snow and so on. So, yeah, let me get up once again. The, the input data is then rainfall and potential evaporation, maybe temperature if you need uh, to describe the snow also. Um, rainfall, uh, what we need here is, is the catchment rainfall. Right? And, and what you typically do is that you get your catchment rainfall uh, from stations that are there in the area. This is an example from Africa, where we have uh, one catchment here, there's another catchment there, like that. Um, and the rainfall is available at these two stations. And that's it. And this is a typical situation. Rainfall stations are there in the village, uh, because then you can ask somebody from the village to look after it, to monitor, to go and measure the rainfall, and to, uh, to keep the... Sorry for interruption here. In fact, uh, I should have raised it earlier while uh, discussing that uh, rainfall run up mm -hmm. Basically, in the mountainous areas where there is also one of the dominant components of precipitation in the form of snowfall, when 
we have the rainfall it gets its expression in the form of the overland flow so there is a major component of snow melt as well which also gets uh, into the channel in the form of the discharge oh, so how to take account of the snow melt uh, while making the different estimations of the model yeah but, well they how to segregate the two that is one is the precipitation on account of the rainfall yeah, yeah, and then yeah. second important component which usually we are facing in the summers yeah. that is the snow melt right. how, how so, to segregate the two so, or how to take no, it so, i mean in a model like this um, where, where snow melt is, is, is described, you could say. Well, partly you, you need to have this uh, division of the catchment in elevation zones because you don't have the same temperature uh, in high elevations as in low, and that's, that makes a major difference, right? So you'll need to do that. Um, then what happens is that the model will then calculate. You have temperature as one of the input, precipitation, potential evaporation. So in the, in the zones where the temperature is negative, when precipitation occurs, that will go into the snow storage and not go into the ground at that time. Um, so so if, you, if you have the data for it and calculate that, you'll see the snow storage is increasing, mainly at high altitude, but maybe in the full catchment, increasing in the, in the, dry, uh, in the, in the cold period. And then when temperature starts to uh, increase and, and it became, becomes uh, warm enough, concern, it starts melting. My concern is slightly different here. Hmm. I will be quoting the example of 2014 floods of Kashmir Valley. It happened in September 2014. Of course, there was a major, I mean, say, event of rainfall for about uh, seven days. But uh, in, the, in some catchments where there is a heavy presence of the snow fields, they have also contributed significantly mm -hmm. towards the discharge of the rivers. Yeah. So th that, 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 that part has not been accounted, I mean to say, well, uh, ac accurately okay. in the discharge, yeah. overall discharge of the rivers. No. So the solution is to account for it. I mean, to, uh, it depends on what, what you're talking about. If you want, you can, you can uh, have it in the forecast model if you want, um, if that's the question, or if it's in planning model, whatever. But, but it's possible to model it. It's a question of what models you're using, right? Um, but, but that's uh, it's just a question of building it in. We're doing that in many parts well, of Europe. The concern is how to segregate the two flows, the part of the precipitation on well, the rainfall and the part of the snow bed. Yeah. How to segregate the two? But why do you want to segregate it? I mean, you, 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 want, you want to... Yeah, because we, our thrust in the runoff model is rainfall runoff model. Yeah, yeah. We are focusing on the rainfall. We are not taking estimators of the... Uh, flow which is contributed on account of the tsunami yeah, at yeah, the same yeah. time. But what I'm saying is that in the model you can build in the, the two of them, right? So you have runoff coming down. Once it's coming, uh, I mean, you, you can still extract how much is from snow and how much is from rainfall. But the main thing is how much is coming in total, I guess. Right? Um, in, in, in Scandinavia, all floods are occurring in the snowmelt season. Uh, so so there, that's the main thing, right? But in many other parts of the world, it's, it's just one of the, the components, right? Here, uh, here in Kashmir, is the combination, basically. Yeah. Combination of snow melt and yeah. Right. Yeah. Do, do you have some in Kashmir also? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, what he's, that's what he's saying, yeah. When, yeah. when you yeah. get the worst combination, then the flood. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is possible to account for the snow melt in, in many models, like yeah. Mike models. They have the snow melt component. Maybe the component you were using, or maybe the component the government agencies are using, they did not account for this no yeah. But once it is accounted, then automatically there is some time lag also. There is some time lag also. So at the at the gauging size, you can see what is the total output. Yeah. And, and that, that was, is important. That was, that was basically precisely the error that ah. they could not they could not account the magnitude of the flood because they have not taken into account the yes. contribution. Yeah. Yes. So so, so yeah, yeah. So the solution is take it into account. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's not. It's not so simple, actually. I mean, if uh, um, one one issue with, with, with snow is that it's not um, um, it's not evenly distributed. The snow, when it falls, it's evenly distributed, but then wind will shift it around. So it tends to be piled up in different in parts, and then you have areas with with basically no snow, and then areas with with, with quite deep snow. So that means as it's melting. You can't just say that it's melting at the same speed all the time. Once it comes down, you need to take this into account, So as we're also doing. Uh, and there are, 
and sometimes when it starts melting, water remains in the snow for a while. Since you're from Kashmir, you probably know the feeling. Fresh new snow is very light, and you know, particular others are heavy, right? A particular event of rainfall, gauging sites already take care of the snow melt. Because yeah, it's it, already gauged to the site. Yeah, and it, it's... Uh, a particular rainfall. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you also see is snow melts even faster when it's raining <laughs> on the snow. Right? So it's quite complicated, but, but it's possible to model, and, and we're we are doing it, and, uh, and it should be in your case also. Okay, um, but in most cases, and what I'll mainly focus on, since this is India, is just the rainfall runoff, right? So we, are, we need the catchment rainfall, and this is what we got, right? So, um, yeah, you can take a Thiessen polygon, um, which I'm sure you all know, Thiessen polygon. So in the middle between these two, you draw a line like this. And based on that, uh, it's, a, it's maybe a 60-40 div, div, division, right? So, so we're saying that this one represents this part of the catchment, and that represents that. And all the rainfall in this is exactly the same as at that location. And all the rainfall up here is exactly the same as that. And that is obviously wrong. I mean, there's, there's no reason why the rainfall up here in this mountain should have anything to do with the rainfall down here in this village. Right? But what can you do? Right? I mean, you, if, if all you have is rainfall at these two locations, you know. Um, we do have other possibilities. I mean, you have... Uh, in some areas, there are radar, and the meteorological radars uh, are getting better, I think. Uh, I was working for four years, in, or for two years, in, in uh, Malaysia, and we were setting up flood forecasting systems in different uh, areas, and they have radar, uh, meteorological radars there. So we tried in these four areas to use the, rain, the radar data, and it was absolutely rubbish. There was no correlation between what they measure on the ground, the rainfall, and what comes out of this radar. But in other, many other parts of the world, uh, it's been very useful. So my, I, I think that there was just calibration issues or some maintenance issues with the radars there. So, so uh, like, like we'll, we'll discuss tomorrow, whenever you have data, check it before you use it. But radars can be quite useful. And then satellites are there, um, which we'll also be looking at in this course uh, in the next few days. Um, so measuring the actual rainfall from satellites has been going on for now more than 20 years, I think, with different methods. Some use uh, uh, the, the temperature of the cloud has some relation to satellites, but also radar directly from, from the satellites uh, beaming down and, and seeing is this just uh, clear weather all the way or is some rain actually falling uh, below us here, right? So, so that's getting better. Um, and you can then combine these different sources, of course, also. Rainfall is required. Uh, for many analysis, daily rainfall is fine. Um, if you're setting up a model for some uh, river basin planning and so on, want to simulate long time series. If it's flood forecasting, you need to go down to at least hourly, but preferably every 10 minutes or, or what's available. Right? <clears throat> Yeah, this uh, GPM, just to mention that a bit, which is probably now the most promising satellite rainfall data available. Um, this, it, it, it measures rainfall in 0 0.1 degree grids, which is about 10 by 10 kilometer. Um, there's a value every 30 minutes, and it's available already after six hours. So six hours after the rainfall has been has occurred, it's online. So we are actually running some flood forecasting systems where we are using this. It's very, it, 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 uh, the satellites, or it was uh, set up for in 2014, and the first year or so was kind of testing. So, so basically two years, two, three years of data is available, and the areas where we are, are working in, we haven't really got reliable flow data yet to actually check how, how well this is performing. Um, so it's, it's very new. This is using all these different satellites. 
uh, including Indian satellites, but US, Europe, Japanese, Japanese, and whatever. And these are measuring rainfall in different ways. So some I think are still, there's the cloud temperature and some uses other methods and so on. And then some software is then merging all this and coming out with the best estimate of the rainfall. They, they may over the years start to change it a bit. Is this available for, uh, I mean to say, for whole globe? Uh, yeah, not, not the very north and very south, but all of India must be. Um, and we, we, we have already set up software that can grab it and feed it to our flood forecasting models and other models so we can, we can use it. Uh, what I don't know yet is how accurate it is. It's free. You can, yeah, yeah, you can just... What is the URL of the site? That I don't know. But, but, uh, yeah, but, but we, are, we download and process um, this data for, uh, uh, for a number of areas. And, and uh, on Thursday... In the past data is also available, like they have uh, past data. Past, not a I mean, the real time is there, but whatever is. Email data is not available. Yes. I mean. Events which have already taken place. So data must have been generated. So that data. Yeah. I think the, the, the last few years is available, yes. Yeah. Last yeah. Last yeah. yeah. Because it's only a few years old. Uh, the. Uh, on, I think it's on Thursday we're going to look at this uh, flood and drought portal that, that we have set up. And one thing we do there is that we download this and save it in our portal. So, so it's available, but there as daily data. It's actually every 30 minutes, but that's too many numbers to, to, to store. So, so on, for subcatchments on daily data, um, you can download that on Thursday if you want. For, it's, it's, uh, what we have done is, is in another project, is to set up this portal for um, international river basins, one of them being Ganges Brahmaputra. Uh, so uh, we'll give you access to that on Thursday, where you can then also look at this data. But it looks promising. And, and if we just go back, um, I mean, looking at a catchment like this, right? and you want to make catch and rainfall, what, you, what is better, this rainfall station or a full coverage of, all, of the whole area in satellite, right? My guess is the satellite. But we, like I say, we still don't know, actually. So it could be interesting to see also some studies, maybe here at the university, of comparing how do you get the best results. And, and that would be to see which rainfall data is the most appropriate to simulate what actually happens downstream. So you need, so if you have areas where you have the down, a good record of the flow downstream and you can then get rainfall data at some stations and satellite data like this, that could be a fun little story, study to see how do we get the best out of it. What is the combination maybe of the ground stations and the, um, and the satellite? So the only problem with the satellite data is that it's a derived product. It's not the actual rainfall that is happening. So it's somehow, with the radar they're imaging, it's a derived product. So we need to match it with actual rainfall. So there, there are reliability issues there. Because yeah. so we are using GPM and DRM data, and we are facing yeah. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the problems, one of the questions you're raising here is, well, you want to compare with the actual rainfall. Yeah. So can you tell me what is the actual rainfall in this catchment? How do, how do I know what the actual rainfall is in this catchment? Actually, we are actually physically having our network of rainfall right. gauges. Right. So, so at, at, at a few spots of about this size, which is the opening of your rain gauge, that's where you know your rainfall. That is where you know your rainfall. We had uh, one, one of my colleagues was uh, experimenting with taking a, a simple ship's radar and turning it into a rainfall radar locally. Uh, and he was setting this up and monitoring rainfall and, and trying to sell the idea and sell the radars and so on. And of course, people are asking, well, how correct is it? So uh, if there's a rain gauge inside uh, where the radar was made, he could then compare. But he never got a full correlation. You know, it was never like pearls on a string. There was always some scattering. And, and then um, one of his explanations was that, well, the radar is me me measuring in the grid. In his case, I think it was 
was 150 by 150 meters. And the rain gauge is a point. Right? So uh, in, in areas where you have showers p passing through, maybe sometimes the shower is outside the rain gauge. Or maybe the shower is mainly on the rain gauge, but not in the rest of the area. Right? So the radar doesn't see the same thing. And it is not the same thing. Right? He said, OK, I'll do a research project. I take this area where it's oh, it was 500 by 500 meters. Within this grid, I put nine rain gauges. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? So they were only 100 or even less meters uh, apart. Then I can really measure in this grid what is the actual rainfall of rain gauges, and then I have my radar, and then hopefully it matches. So we measured in some site in Denmark where during a period where we have showers coming and also a few days with widespread rain, but, but mainly showers. After those three, four months of monitoring, uh, he then also compared the, these nine rain gauges, which were just next to each other. The total rainfall in, that, the rain f in the gauge that got the highest was twice the rainfall in the one that got the lowest. Within a few hundred meters. Double, right? So how can you, I mean, this is impossible. The point I want to stress is the reason we are using satellite data is not because of the reliability. It is just because it is, uh, we, are have, we are getting the seamless seamless transfer of continuous data to running a model that is essential mm. and also we have transboundary uh, catchments also so for that we don't have our rain gauges installed in other countries right. so that is the condition why we are using yeah. data but reliability is, is an issue because we are facing right. that yeah. Yeah. So somehow we have to post process uh, the satellite data to make it more refined and yeah. Yeah. improve yeah. the quality then it will be a good uh, data to use in Kalpoka uh, so are you, you, you using TRMM or GPM? TRMM, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the expectation is that the GPM is better, right? Because it's a finer grid. It's finer grid. It's using different sources. Yeah. But with these different satellites, you're looking at the rainfall in different ways, right? So, but it, I haven't seen it proven yet. I mean, we, uh, so it's, uh, I'm looking forward to that. But, but I mean, like I said, we, we are doing the same thing in, in areas where we don't have... Uh, Enough uh, ground uh, rainfall. You can of course. That is not a problem because uh, even IMD is having a very uh, dense network of yeah, rain yeah. gauges. So that is sufficient enough to actually calibrate the satellite data, I, I guess. Even now we have this network of automatic weather stations. Yeah. At different parts. Yeah. So far they yeah. <clears throat> but, but, um, but like I said, very local changes can actually also, or differences can make, can make a difference here also. Um, one, one, one question you may ask, referring again to the story I just told, that within 500 meters you have this huge difference. How is it at all possible to model rainfall runoff? Why haven't we given up years ago? And I think one of the reasons is that um, when, you're, when you're simulating hydrology for quite some time, you're getting small peaks and low flow, and then but occasionally there's a big peak. right? So whenever you're plotting your results, that's the scale. And the big peaks, they come when there's widespread rainfall. They're raining everywhere. So the rain gauges are quite representative of that. Uh, in, others, in the small peaks, which disappear in the plot because they're down here, and they actually, they might be 100% wrong, but they are 20 instead of 10, right? And, and the big peak is 500. Right? So, so you don't see that in your graph. Um, the small peaks occur when it rains only in this part of the catchment, where you need to be lucky if the rain on the rain gauge is actually representing the catchment rainfall. But widespread rain, then it works. Right? Uh, this is more pertinent to these uh, mountainous areas where we have the significant uh, precipitation variability along the altitudinal gradients as well. Mm. That's not being taken care of with these rain gates. That, that is uh, very much yeah, well, yeah, exactly. We're, we're in high areas and so on. Yeah. Um, and that's also what we're seeing here, basically, that, that you have uh, this is relatively low land, and these are the high locations, right? And there's not a single rain gauge up here. So a bit the same issue. There are, there are different possibilities. If wind generally comes from here, then the wind will tend to be uh, lifted by this mass, and, and these may even be close enough to actually produce a lot of rainfall by the lifting masses here. If the wind is coming over the hill and down here, then you'll have more rainfall up here than you have down here because it's coming down, right? So generally, lifting air masses is producing more rainfall. Right? 
There is no sort of one general solution and one answer to whatever you, sh you should do. The best is probably get whatever data you can of different sources and then see what works for you uh, in, in to solve whatever problem you're. I just want, I just want to ask one thing is DHI is currently using an hybrid form of then for data source of satellite and ground combined together? Well, in this area, for example, we do that. And, and increasingly, we're doing this. I mean, because it's very rare to find catchments where your coverage or rain gauges is really so, so great that you don't need anything else, right? Um, but it's still rather experimental, uh, and we are very cautious, mainly with the satellite data, because we don't really know how good it is. And then it might also be very good here, but then it's not good over there. Same with the radar, as I just told you. Uh, we have very good experience with radar data in many parts of the world, but in Malaysia, it turned out not to work, right? And, and so, so you always need to be careful with your data, which we will talk more about tomorrow. So pan evaporation is the other, or evaporation, potential evaporation, sorry, is the other type of data that you'll need. And you can use a pan, or you can use uh, different kind of calculations, like uh, penman um which is then based on radiation and wind speed and temperature and so on. Generally, the, the data like penman Montes is better than the pan. The, the pan sits there, it gets heated by the sun more than the catchment. It's not really representing sort of catchment uh, uh, rainfall, whereas penman Montes is more accurate. The problem is, though, that, that often you, you'll find that maybe next to this uh, rain gauge, and maybe that one, there's also a pan. But the closest meteorological um, station that has all this wind speed and radiation, that's located over here somewhere, right? So it's not even near your catchment area. And then it might be better to use the available pans than, than, uh, than the, uh, the penman Montes. Okay, so I'll... Um, what I'll do now, I'll make a little demonstration of the way we work with this NAM model. Uh, actually, for uh, this catchment here. So take this one um, and, and use these rain gauges and see if I can make a model out of that. And then I thought, if it's not too late, then I thought we'll go and, and try this NAM calibrator thing. And if if we're too tired, then we'll skip it for tomorrow. But let's see. But let me make this demonstration now. <coughs> Where is this here? So what, what I've done here, and I don't know if I can increase this, but what I, I, here I've opened our Mic 11, uh, which runs both river models and, and rainfall runoff and sediment transport, whatever, many different types. But this is just the rainfall runoff. In general, we always have different uh, files to do this. And here's one called the simulation file, where you then selected what model you want to run, hydrodynamic, advection dispersion. I just selected rainfall runoff. And then the input to that uh, is this one, which is over here. So here is actually the NAM model setup. It's a catchment, uh, w which is 325 square kilometers um, in size, and there are then different parameters. So in the beginning, just some standard parameters like here, uh, which you then need to change to match the actual conditions here. Time series are specified. There's a weighted rainfall, and, and what I've done in this case is just to give them an equal weight. So, um, so actually not even use the full T's, and I just said 50-50 of these two uh, rain gauges at least for now. There is evaporation at the station called Mimosa, which is here. So there's a pan evaporation available there. And then there's a measured uh, discharge at the, at the outflow point about here. So the data is given and parameters are there. And we have built an automatic calibration procedure um, which you can use. So, so if we just start that, this is then uh, running the model once. Uh, then it runs uh, an auto calibration where it actually makes 2,000 simulations. So it, it changes the parameters in some intelligent way. Um, runs it again, 
change, you know, keeps trying, trial and error, but, but searches in an intelligent way uh, 2,000 times. Once it, it's happy, then it runs it once again, and then it's over. And that has just, no, this is the last one. Um, so, so this was 2002 simulations that has just been made. The first one just to get started, then the 2000 for auto calibration, and then one saving the uh, results. So we have some results now, which will be in here. <coughs> and this is then uh, partly a time series here of the measured and observed, and then uh, an accumulated time series where the, the black here is the, uh, is the simulation. So in the first many years, we actually simulate too much, and then not enough, so we end up with a water balance. This also calibration will always try to ensure the water balance at the end here. And there's a calibration that look like this. So the red lines are the measured flow, and the black is the model. And we can already now see we have some big peaks here. The model is not catching. But then other areas like, uh, like the one here, where the model is ma making smaller peaks which are then actually larger than what is measured. So as you can see down here in the total, that it all in all, it's enough, or it, it matches. But zooming in at the variation from year to year, there are, uh, there's quite some variation. So here we are, the peaks are too high. These ones are reasonably good. This is again too high. Um, this year, we are generally too low. So it's often like that. You're too low, you're too high. Sometimes you cannot do much about it. But often at this stage, what we do is we, we consider then, well, what is the purpose of this? If, if this is a model that is set up for estimating the inflow to a reservoir uh, for sort of design, maybe not the, not, not the flood in, inflow, but the average inflow over a longer period of time. Well, we could see the water balance was matching. It was... Some years too high, too low, but all in all it was okay. So maybe for that it's fine. Maybe we can stop here. If we're interested in the peaks uh, and we want to know, we want to simulate the big peaks, well then obviously we're, this is not a good model. Uh, we could see that these peaks over here, we simulated all the peaks were too low here. And, and there's a big one here in the middle where also uh, the simulation is much lower. Um, this is very likely actually to be a case where the rainfall of these two rain gauges was much lower than the catchment rainfall. And whatever we change the parameters is not going to change that. Um, if, if it's essential to be able to simulate peaks of, uh, of that, uh, of this particular peak, well, then we give up or we say, okay, let's try other sources of rainfall, let's do something else. But with this data, we cannot do it. Right? Um, but maybe the, maybe the purpose is to simulate the, uh, the regime here. What is the general distribution between high flow and low flow? Um, maybe we can't expect to do that accurately with this data and get that the rainfall at these two stations will tell us when we had the huge runoff from the catchment. Very likely that's not possible. But maybe we can generate runoff that looks like the runoff we're getting, we measured down there, have the same number of high peaks and the same number of small peaks, same kind of, kind of base flow, the same duration curve, basically. Right? Maybe that's possible. Um, but let's see what we can do in general. Typically what what we would do is we go back and look at the parameters that we got out of this. <coughs> this uh, what's called Umax and Lmax here. Um, they are 10 in 100. I don't know whether you can see the numbers. Um, in the auto calibration that we are using, we are setting 10 and 100 as the lower boundary. So that's the lowest values acceptable. The, the auto calibration will take these parameters and vary it with, between the lower and upper boundary. Uh, in this case, it's 10 and 20 for the upper, and it's uh, 100 and 200 for this lower zone. 
So it varies within that and has apparently decided that the best solution here is just around that one boundary, right? So it's actually been trying to go even lower than that, but because of these restrictions, it can't. That indicates that uh, we are probably, it has a big problem getting the water balance correct. These two parameters, this upper zone where it evaporates freely and the lower zone where you have also evaporation taking place, um, are, are very much controlling the water balance because that's where the evaporation takes place. The rainfall that comes in, you can't change that. The measured discharge that goes out is also given. So it's just the evaporation that you can actually do something about. Um, and here, as we're hitting the, this uh, boundary of this parameter, it's indicating that there's an issue with the data. Uh, it could be that the rainfall is actually not representing the, uh, the actual rainfall in the catchment, which it probably isn't. So you might want to change the, the way you're using it, change the weights. And I wouldn't mind going 80% to one and 20 to another or, or like that for these two. I mean, forget season. If one of them has more rainfall than the other, generally, try to give it some more weight and see if that solves it. Uh, what is also likely, though, in this case is that the evaporation is probably not um, well described. We have the catchment here. and the evaporation station was here at Mimosa, which is obviously at a lower location than much of the catchment. Right? So the catchment evaporation is probably lower than what you measure down there at this Mimosa station. So one thing we might do is to, uh, to change that. And let me see if I've already, yeah, I've already done that. I put in an, uh, a time series here which has less than this. So maybe let me just show you that one also. Um, so we have just generated a time series. Uh, the blue dots here, all of these are 80% of the black ones. Right? So uh, this is the annual variation in this part of Africa, or this location uh, of the Potential evaporation, 140 millimeters in this month, 60 down here, or uh, 70 like that. So, so the blue one here is just generated, and it's simply 80% of the, of the higher one. Um, so if we use that instead, and just save this and run it again, that may, uh, that may change conditions. Now we, are, we probably have a better estimate of the catchment potential evaporation because it's lower. Whether it should be 80 or 70 or 90, you can then um, keep, keep testing if you want. But, but let's see if this one helps. Uh, and maybe we get parameters that are not so restricted by their uh, limits in the variation, but, but more uh, uh, f freely selected. So let's make another plot of this one. And if we start down here, well, this looks more or less the same in total. I wonder whether I actually change this. Let's just see. Yeah, it, it, it did made some change, not much in the graph, apparently. At least the parameters are more freely moving here. Let me just open this one again. I think we're, it's a bit closer than it was before, so it's, it's following slightly better. One we didn't look at is down here you have an R square, uh, which can also some indication of how well it's matching. But it helped on the overall balance, but still we have the problems that the peaks are, um, are not representative. Right? So what we often do is look at these different uh, time series, see can we, can we improve the simulation by changing the weights? Can we improve them by, like I did here, maybe looking at what is representative uh, in terms of evaporation and so on. Um, when that's finished, now I'm not going to do it anymore just now, we might then also, um, as I mentioned, look into whether <coughs> we can manually perhaps uh, make some changes to these parameters 
that gives results which are more uh, towards what we want to see. Um, and like I mentioned, one of the problems in this one is that the peaks are very low. We have a couple of, of parameters here that are controlling peaks. One is this overland flow coefficient, which is about half, 0.5 here. So I could try to give that a higher value. Let me give it 0.7. And then we have a routing constant, which is determining the shape of the peaks, whether they are flashy and high, or whether they are low and, and, uh, and rather thick. So I change that as well. And this time, not run it with any auto calibration, but just make a simulation. And then we'll see whether that changes. One nice thing about this NAM model is it runs very quickly. So, so now you can see that this is a very different picture if we just compare the two. So this is the one we had where all the simulations are relatively low. And then now suddenly we're generating a lot of high peaks. We don't get all the way up to this one, but, but several that are significantly higher than they were before. Um, so this is a year where the simulation is actually higher than even the highest uh, uh, measured peak. But then there are other years like this one where it is, uh, it is somewhat closer. You can't really see that here. Um, here is one that actually by chance is sort of more or less matching in the um, in, in, in maximum. A lot of peaks we generate at times when they did not occur, they were not measured, but again we're generating them on the basis of rainfall of these two rain gauges, which are in the outskirts of the catchment. Right? And then still we have other peaks measured that are higher than what we simulate. Um, so what what you would typically do, if, if the purpose is to generate uh, runoff that looks like what we have uh, simulated, so we have the same distribution and time models, then you take these into, you make duration curves of both the simulated and observed, and then you basically calibrate on duration curves. And then that is then the, uh, the way you find, uh, you generate that model, as such. Right? If the purpose suits that. I mean, if you're, then you might do this, right? Uh, to a large extent, you can say in this area, forget about it. I mean, it's, it's, we just don't have the data to do a decent model in this area. And for many purposes, that is the conclusion. Um, but like I said, sometimes you can at least get closer um, by doing it like this. Any questions to... So, uh, have you... Uh Sensitivity parameters is most sensitive towards the runoff generation. Like, like uh, if you take the case of evaporation, I mean, uh, we generally give a constant evaporation over a period of time, and even if you give the time series, there is hardly any difference in the runoff. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. evaporation parameter is not so sensitive, I can say, to towards the uh, runoff generation. Like all other parameters that we have mentioned. Yeah. Uh, do we have some kind of sensitivity analysis? Like well, which parameter is most sensitive to the output? Yeah, there are, uh, we have that, and, and it's also, there's a little, for this particular model, there's a document on the computer that uh, we'll be using, which just describes briefly the, the NAM model and, and the parameters in the main effect. Evaporation is mainly important for water balance, you can say, overall, right? So for a specific event, for a peak, uh, where heavy rainfall occur, whether it evaporates four or five millimeters that day doesn't matter, right? As you say. Um, but, but typically when you're making the, when you're calibrating the model overall and you're typically using several years, it's still important to have the evaporation reasonably well described because otherwise your overall water balance will be wrong and that's going to still affect uh, other conditions, right? Um, including perhaps the soil moisture at the time when this heavy rainfall occurs, right? Um, we have um, been using this model for a long time and one of my colleagues, who is one of these IT geniuses that uh, can do anything, he claims that he was sitting in an aeroplane, well, he, he was living in Australia and he's Danish, so it takes a long time to fly to Denmark. And then he thought, I will program this NAM model 
in a tool where you can more easily change the parameters. And he claims that he finished at the time he landed in Copenhagen. I don't know whether he's right. But, but that is this little tool, it doesn't run the model operationally, but if, if you want to if you want to calibrate it and find out what, what are the impact of different parameters and so on, it, it works reasonably well. And that's the one I thought we should go to the lab and, and try. And that's the last that I have on the program today. Maybe I should just, can, in the lab, is there, can you demonstrate in the lab also? Yes, we have the little bit. Okay, then I think I'll demonstrate it while, when we're there. So, did, did we forget about tea? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should have tea. Yeah. And then we and then we'll see. And then we start in the lab at what time? Whether we want to go later day or continue. I mean we could also take it tomorrow. We we don't tomorrow we don't have so much on the program. Yeah. So if you prefer just tea and go. Tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow. We'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> we'll have that. Yeah. It's a very fun day. Yeah. I'm not gonna talk this much every day. <laughs> Okay, so let's have tea and then we call it a day. All right.